We are um, privileged to have with us Dr. Kevin Wayne Cosby, one of the premier preachers and now uh, college administrators, college presidents in the country. So um, many of our viewers know who you are, but tell for those, for the one or two people who may not know who Kevin Wayne Cosby <laughs> is, tell, tell us some about yourself. Well, first and foremost, I thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I cannot put into words um, how grateful I am for the great work that you're doing and the influence that you're having upon um, creating excellence and celebration of black preaching. So thank you for um, in inviting me to be a part of this. Um, first and foremost, I'm the husband of Barnetta Cosby, Barnetta Turner Cosby. We've been married um, almost 39 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have two adult children and um, uh, a granddaughter who will turn two on my birthday, mm. July the 15th, since she was born on my birthday. Wow, that's special. Uh, so um, that is very important to me, you know, being grounded first and foremost uh, in my family. Um, the, your family is your corner. Mm. If you could consider life or ministry as a boxing match, mm -hmm. you box for three rounds, then you come back to your corner. Right. So you, every preacher, every minister needs uh, a corner, mm -hmm. and so th that's very important to me. And then I'm, I'm the pastor of St. Stephen Baptist Church. It's in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, it, it is located in one of the poorest zip codes in America, uh, but it is a thriving, vibrant, uh, growing church uh, that has a philosophy that says you do not have to belong to St. Stephen Baptist Church, for St. Stephen Baptist Church to belong to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the question we constantly ask ourselves at St. Stephen Church is, if we were to go out of business, would the community miss us? Mm -hmm. And I am confident that uh, the community would miss us because of our interaction with the community in terms of uh, being a servant institution uh, that seeks to meet needs both spiritual uh, empowerment and social justice advocacy. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also the president of one of the oldest private black colleges in America, Simmons College of Kentucky, um, which was f the genesis of Sen Simmons came four months after the close of the Civil War when Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in April 1865, four months after that event, um, the newly, the freed people of Kentucky, Baptists, decided that a school was needed if they were going to maximize freedom. And they wanted a school in which they would be in governance. They did not want a school in which the governance was in the hands of whites that would restrict the type of education that they could pursue. Wow. So it became at one time the only black college and, and it started in 1879, they got their, their start, but it, the genesis of it was after the Civil War. And it was founded in 1879 and it is, it is primarily known by the presidency of William J. Simmons, who was president for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, most people don't know who William J. Simmons is. Mm -hmm. But William J. Simmons, according to Gary Dorian, probably the preeminent ethicist at Union Theological Seminary, who's uh, written prolifically, a, in fact, a two-volume book that I highly recommend, one on W.E.B. Du Bois and the black social gospel tradition. I mean, it is voluminous. Mm -hmm. And then he just came out with his second book, which is, it has to be a thousand pages <laughs> of, of, um, of great, wonderfully researched material about Dr. King and the civil rights struggle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Cone, James Cone thinks that Gary Dorian is, he considers him to be the greatest uh, ethicist on the planet. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in his first volume, the person that he lifts up is William J. Simmons, mm -hmm. Henry McNeil Turner. Mm -hmm. William J. Simmons. Mm -hmm. And William J. Simmons, who was the president of Simmons College, uh, is basically the founder 
of the National Baptist Convention. Mm -hmm. In much, much of your work, mm -hmm. you cite mm -hmm. William J. Simmons, mm -hmm. uh, his book, Men of Mark, yeah. Yeah. which chronicles yeah. I remember that. Men of yes, Mark, yes, who chronicles yes, yes. all of the great preachers of the 19th century. Yeah, so yes. anyone who wants to know anything about preachers in the 19th century, mm -hmm. it's William J. Simmons. Wow. Prathia Hall yes. came to Louisville mm -hmm. f uh, to study William J. Simmons because he was a womanist mm. scholar in the 19th century. Wow. And she was blown away by him. He, he was, he, he uh, Ida B. Wells, uh, Ida B. Wells said, if it were not for William J. Simmons, I would not have become a journalist. He gave her her first job. Mm -hmm. So he was a womanist, Gary Dorian called him one of the preeminent intellectuals of the day, and, but he died young. Mm -hmm. He died young, and he said, had he not died young, um, and had we known our tradition, that's why what you're doing is so important, because you are helping to make mainstream uh, those sources of black preaching and black theology that black people are just oblivious to. So I'm the president of that institution. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, as I said, started in 1879. <clears throat> During its zenith, it was the only black governed college with a law school, medical school, liberal arts college. One of our law school students named Wiley, uh, he, was, um, he sued the city of Louisville because of residential house of segregation mm -hmm. back in 1914. Mm -hmm. the, the, the NAACP, founded in 1909, picked up his case, mm -hmm. took it to the Supreme Court, and the Warley versus Buchanan decision of 1917, which ended government-sanctioned uh, segregation, segregation initiated by municipality, the, the C, NAACP won that case. That was the first case mm. the NAACP won mm. before the Supreme Court in 1917. So it, it, it's back to Simmons. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Simmons downsized as a, as a university in 1930, casualty of the Depression. Mm -hmm. And the University of Louisville took over our campus mm -hmm. and our programs mm -hmm. and our degrees and our fraternities and our sororities. The oldest Delta, one of the oldest Delta chapters in America is the Delta chapter at the University of Louisville. And that is because it started at Simmons, even though University of Louisville had not integrated into 1951. Mm -hmm. uh, so we downsized and from 1931, it most people knew Simmons only as a Bible college mm -hmm. when it was a full-fledged university. So I knew about Simmons, um, August history, because my grandfather attended there in the 20s. Mm -hmm. He's the organizing pastor of St. Stephen Church, where I pastor. Mm -hmm. And he, he graduated there with a degree in mathematics and then went on and became the first black uh, to graduate at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So my grandfather integrated Southern Seminary. He was a brilliant scholar, mm -hmm. taught New Testament and Greek at Simmons for many years, mm -hmm. and mathematics, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, so when I became president, <clears throat> my vision was to return Simmons, to introduce Simmons to its unknown self, mm. um, which is what preaching should always do. I think that sometimes the goal of preaching should not be to give people new information, mm -hmm. but just to help them feel confident in what they already know is true, giving them the power to pursue what they already know is right, or to introduce them to their undiscovered selves or their unknown selves. And so I wanted to introduce city, the city and the nation that was part of my mission to our undiscovered self. And um, we pursued accreditation, <clears throat> we acquired our accreditation, and because we, once we achieved accreditation and added non-theological degrees, like business and sociology and other degrees, 
we then were eligible for HBCU status, historical black college university status, because in order to be an HBCU, you had to be in existence mm -hmm. prior to 1964. Mm -hmm. And you had to be in existence or you never could, you never sh could have closed. Mm -hmm. And Simmons started in 1879. Mm -hmm. We downsized, they took everything from us, all of our departments, our law school, and then mandated that we, with a no compete clause, that we could not start or teach any other class that is not theological that would compete with the University of Louisville. Mm -hmm. So the only thing they left us was with the Bible. Now think about that. <laughs> they just gave us the Bible, said, we'll give you the Bible. And when God is all you got, God is all you need. So we, um, we pursued HBCU status and uh, we became the 107th designated HBCU. Now to say 107th designated HBCU is different than saying the 107th HBCU. The 107th designated because we are older than many black private colleges mm -hmm. starting in 1879. But we did not get the designation uh, until 2015. So we, be, we are in the state of Kentucky, the only private HBCU in the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting, our connection with Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a um, black newspaper here. I think it was called the Indiana Freedmen or something like that. Mm -hmm. And every week they had a Simmons section. Mm -hmm. Indianapolis Freedmen or something like that. But, it's, um, but it was a very prominent black newspaper that uh, existed in the turn of the 20th century. I think it may have gone into business in the 1930s. But it was very prominent. Um, Madam C.J. Walker's personal aide was a Simmons professor. So we've got a Madam C.J. Walker piece uh, in, at, at Simmons uh, in, um, in our archives. Yeah. So that's basically what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. So that you know, that sounds like a whole lot, and you're doing yeah. it, you're doing it very well. Thank you. So, what would you say would be um, one of the keys that you've been able to really um, move Simmons toward this vision and give the exposure, the history, and, and ignite the school? So, what what would you say if you had to say a couple things about how you were able to do that? As I said, my mission was to introduce the city, the state of Kentucky, city of Louisville, state of Kentucky, and this nation to this treasure called Simmons. Um, one of the casualties of integration was the disintegration of black memory, um, which is what the Jewish people in the Bible fought hard to keep alive. Um, those 10 Northern tribes would still be in existence had they been able to, to maintain memory. What kept the Jerusalemites alive and Judah alive, even in Babylon or in Persia, was memory. When Cyrus becomes um, uh, king of Persia, Second Chronicles, the last chapter, talks about um, Cyrus's decree. And Zerubbabel, who was the grandson of one of the last kings of Judah, says, I'm, leaving a del I'm leading a delegation. Uh, it, you know, you read the book of Ezra, the first six or seven chapters, it talks about Zerubbabel going back and building the temple. But he says, I'm leading a delegation. Now, he's the grandson of one of the kings of Judah, one of the last kings. But the fact that he, he, he would be willing to leave the comfort of Persia and go back and rebuild um, Jerusalem says that even though he was in Babylon, quote unquote, Persia, he never contracted amnesia. Mm -hmm. And one of the dangers 
of blacks being in Babylon or Persia is the disintegration of memory. And one of my missions at Simmons was to unapologetically awaken black people from the cultural and historic amnesia that integration inflicted upon black people. So black people are discovering constantly. I didn't know we did this. For example, I mentioned the Worley versus Buchanan decision. <clears throat> this is the first it happened in 1917. That was last year, 100 years ago. In Louisville today, there is a historical marker, Worley versus Buchanan, first Supreme Court win by the NAACP. It's a historical marker in Louisville. The historical marker would not be there had not memory been restored. So what makes Simmons unique is first of all, the governance is in the hands of black people. And because it's in the hands of black, conscious black people, not black simply in terms of pigmentation, but black in terms of identification. Uh, then when you are black and in terms of identification, then everything from curriculum to images to agenda reflects uh, uh, your black awokeness. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what is unique, I think, about Simmons. Um, we exist for the black community unapologetically. We um, exist especially for black kids who have been casualties of the public school system and do not know their genius and brilliance. So we reach the unreachable and teach the unteachable and patiently help late bloomers flower, hmm. mm -hmm. which is the mission, should be the historic, should be the mission of an HBCU. Our tuition intentionally is the most affordable of all the HBCUs in America. We have had no student graduate from Simmons with student loan debt, not one. Because um, I am graciously compensated as the pastor of St. Stephen Baptist Church. In my 13 years as the president of Simmons, I have turned in all of my salary, mm -hmm. which is over 13 years is quite substantial. Mm -hmm. But every check has been turned back over to the school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that my successor has to do that. I'm sure my <laughs> successor, whoever she or he is, will not do it. Uh, but John Herrick Clark, said that one generation must be willing to wear what he said, dungarees, so that the next generation can wear suits. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to wear the dungarees. I'm the dungaree generation. Mm -hmm. And I'm the dungaree generation because the generation before me wore dungarees so that I could wear some suits. Mm -hmm. So every generation should have in their wardrobe mm -hmm. dungarees and suits. The problem is we love suits, but we don't love the dungarees. Mm -hmm. And you, if you're, you're not Christian, in my opinion, especially in the black tradition, if you can't show me where your dungarees are, mm -hmm. where you've sacrificed for, uh, so that others might wear suits. And um, we also, we're an advocate for the black community in Louisville and the state of Kentucky and the nation. We have a forum every month called the West Louisville Forum. West Louisville is where the concentration of black people live. And every month we have a monthly forum in which people from all over the city come and pack it out. Now, where Simmons is, where St. Stephen Church is, uh, is, a, is a highly segregated, concentrated poverty area. And people 
are making the bridge into our community because of what we have to offer that is of substance, especially in terms of intellectual substance. And we bring in scholars, we're bringing in, for example, um, next month a woman named Rochelle Riley who's written a book called The Burden, which is a book of essays on this continued psychological legacy of, of enslavement on black people. We've had Karen Cox, brilliant PhD historian. She was with us last month. Every month we bring in people like that who wrote a book on the lost cause theory of the Confederates and how lost cause mythology has infiltrated um, the whole d debate over statutes and icons and curriculum. Most of that is being driven by the lost cause mythologies um, of the um, of, of, the, of the early 20th century. So we've had brilliant scholars. We just had Richard Rothstein, who wrote the book, The Color of Law. We had um, Edward Baptist, Cornell University historian, who wrote the book, um, The Half Has Never Been Told. In fact, if I were teaching a class on the, on the effects of white supremacy on black people, all you really need is two books, and that is um, Edward Baptist's book, The Half Has Never Been Told. Now, it's going to take an eternity to get through it, <laughs> but Edward Baptist's book, The Half Has Never Been Told, and then he's going to take you through black enslavement to 1865, and then Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. Uh, Bill Gates last year read that book, and listed it as one of the most influential books that he read um, in, 19, uh, in 2017. <clears throat> so, you know, having an HBCU in Louisville means that we've got a, the black intellectual capital with passion and boldness that is advocating for black people and confronting anything uh, that seeks to diminish blackness. Mm -hmm. So as a part of all of this, of course, your preaching is, uh, is central and you are one of the premier preachers in the, in the country. So tell us some about preaching mentors for you. Well, first, of, uh, I mentioned my grandfather, B.J. Miller Sr. He was my um, first model for preaching and I, I wanted to be like him. Um, it's, I cannot remember a time in my life uh, that I did not want to be a preacher. And that was because he was my model. Uh, and he actually had one of the trustees when I was four or five years old, build me a makeshift pulpit. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, when I became pastor of St. Stephen's in 1979, the trustee who built that, was a carpenter, was, was still on the trustee board, a great man named um, Thomas Birch, but anyway, um, so he was my first mentor. It was because of his intellect and piety. Um, in fact, Dr. Thomas, you put me in memory of, of my granddad, B.J. Miller Sr. You, you guys would, uh, y'all, you know, very, very similar. Um, and then there was another man, man who licensed me, who was very charismatic, but had his demons. But he's the one that rescued me from self-loathing. Uh, I had no confidence. Uh, um, I had it when I was young. My mother passed when I was relatively young and our family moved from the black community like the Jeffersons to an all white community, an all white school. And I went down because in every area of my life uh, because I just could not connect with the culture. What I did different, to quote Jeremiah Wright, I was different. They defined that as being deficient. And I was resistant to this imp imposition of white norms into my life. So instead of embracing white norms, I just shut down. Our family was, I went, we went back to church, to the black church. And this man named Charles Mims, who was my 
uncle by marriage took me in and poured into me and made me believe that I was the prime minister of the entire universe at 15. <laughs> he made me believe I was somebody. And I rose to his expectations. He um, was an alcoholic. And eventually he um, had to resign from his church uh, because of the disease and went all the way down the skid row, but came back up and started pastoring again in Los Angeles. He was brilliant, brilliant. In fact, he almost brought Muhammad Ali back to the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. That's how brilliant was. Muhammad Ali never went anywhere without Charles Mims Jr. Mm -hmm. When Muhammad Ali fought in Manila, he would take more. In fact, the church that, that I started attending, Reverend Mims' church, was the church of Muhammad Ali. His mother, Odessa mm -hmm. Clay, um, was a member of the church. That is why when Odessa Clay Muhammad's mother passed, I preached her funeral. Mm -hmm. When Muhammad Ali passed, I was one of the eulogists mm -hmm. um, at Muhammad Ali's funeral. Mm -hmm. um, so Reverend Mills was one of my preaching mentors, my grandfather, my dad, who was not a preacher, but a lay person who stressed the importance of study. Uh, he was born a sharecropper in Northern Alabama, born poor, but went on and got his degree and was the president of the local NAACP in Louisville and a very successful realtor in Louisville, but he stressed college. All of my siblings have degrees. One is a lawyer, but uh, one of my sisters uh, who is uh, Pam, who is kind of out there. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a Pam, she's my, she's my heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in spite of her issues, mm -hmm. it was instilled in us the importance of getting your college education. So all of us have degrees. Mm -hmm. And um, so he would be one of my preaching mentors. Uh, and then in terms of people of national stature, it would have to be uh, F.G. Sampson. F.G. Sampson, who pastored in Louisville. Um, F.G. Sampson, Bill Jones, William Augustus Jones. Mm -hmm. I loved F.G. Sampson uh, because of his style. I loved Bill Jones uh, because of his sanctified arrogance. Um, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation, I was telling Bill Jones uh, what I was doing it on and it was uh, on the infusion of Afrocentrism into the black church. And Bill Jones in his very deep voice said to me, I, he said, Cosby, we called that nigritude <laughs> uh, when I was in school. And then he said, um, he said, I didn't need nigritude uh, because I never felt inferior to anyone. In fact, my problem was I felt superior to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and that sanctified arrogance, mm -hmm. always when I was around him, I loved it because that's what black people need. Um, Michael Eric Dyson's book on pride, mm -hmm. and, and Eric, who is brilliant, mm -hmm. I love Michael Eric Dyson. Mm -hmm. Michael Eric Dyson's book on pride, said that the absence of pride is a sin for black people. Mm -hmm. That the sin of black people is not pride, but the absence of pride is the sin of black people. Mm -hmm. So um, Bill Jones, because of his sanctified arrogance, and then Mac King Carter, mm -hmm. who was, we were very, very, very close. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Carter, uh, because of his theme of social justice and reparations mm -hmm. for black people. I could hear him saying um, that man, the only thing that the white church can give black people is some unpaid money. <laughs> unpaid money, that's, that's Matt Carter. Mm -hmm. And then of course, um, I love the preaching of Jeremiah Wright. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and I've, 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 I loved his preaching. So these are people who I took uh, some of Mac's um, letters. 
I took some cucumbers from uh, Jeremiah, some, t some tomatoes from Samson, and some onions from some of the other people. And I took their ingredients and then I made my own tall salad, which I think is, is what all of us do. We take something from everybody and uh, we make our own tall salad. So how would you describe your preaching? Heavy on application. Um, all of uh, Jesus was heavy on application. Uh, he was less a um, theologian, if you will. Uh, I think he was more of a practical theologian. And I think Paul was more of the theologian and understandably so because Paul was bringing it into different cultures. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the concepts that we, we, we um, wrestle with in terms of Paul's theology is Paul trying to help people understand Christ within the context of a Hellenistic mindset. So he's using images and metaphors that are natural to the Hellenistic mindset. That was unnecessary within the context of Jesus because Jesus was preaching within a Jewish context in which there was a common theology or the assumption, the theological assumptions. So Jesus was, was, was already agreed upon. So Jesus was heavy on application. Now there's theology, if you want to talk about grace, well, you can't read the story of the prodigal son and not understand grace. You cannot not read the story of the laborers who go out at different times of the day and they get paid, one gets paid who goes out at five and gets paid like the ones who went out at six, you know? And so that's a concept of grace without going into any theory of grace, you see the application of grace. Um, so I try to be, first of all, give people as U.S. News and World Report says, news you can use. Mm -hmm. And heavy on application. Mm -hmm. um, I also try to make my preaching very targeted and contextual to black needs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it, um, bef there was a time because Dr. King was trained at Crozier in Boston University that Dr. King's illustrations and metaphors were primarily white metaphors and illustrations. He moved beyond that to use more black uh, metaphors or so to quote Dr. K Matt King Carter, he dipped it in chocolate. Mm -hmm. So um, my preaching is very targeted to the black experience and to the black situation. Whites do it. Uh, whiteness is a default in, in, you know, in the culture. They do it by default. Um, I intentionally do it. And I think that's biblical. Um, the reason you have four gospels, especially when you think of the fact that, what, 75% of Mark's materials is found in Matthew. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you have four gospels is we have four evangelists who are sensitive to different people groups. When Jesus was crucified according to John's gospel, on the cross, Pilate had it written in Hebrew, the language of the Jews, and he had it written in, in Roman or in Greek, we have Hebrew, uh, Greek, the language of the Mediterranean world, and Latin, it was written in, in the language of the Romans. So you had, you know, it was like he was saying, I want to communicate, this is what happens when you interfere with Pax Romana. When you interfere with the peace of Rome, this is crucifixion happens. And it says in John's gospel, and he wrote it in Latin, in Greek, and in Hebrew. So if Pilate had a, enough sense 
to understand that to communicate a message, you have to take serious your target audience. Then we should. And that's the that's why you have Matthew, the evangelist who writes with Jewish sensibilities in mind. Jews are concerned about um, a man's lineage. And so Matthew starts off talking about the lineage of Jesus and takes him back to David because they're concerned about lineage. That's, that's Jewish sensibilities. You know, they're concerned about whether there's congruency between what Jesus is saying in Old Testament. And so you have a lot of Old Testament as it is written. But if you turn the page to Mark, you don't have that. You don't have lineage. You have one thing in the 16 chapters of Mark that you don't find in any of the other gospels, and that's miracles. Mark is the miracle gospel. Uh, in 16 chapters, you have more miracles. It's the shortest gospel, but more miracles because Mark is writing to Romans. He's John Marcus. Marcus is a Roman name. So he's writing to a Roman audience and Rome is only concerned. They don't concern about your lineage. Rome is white America. Rome is concerned about one thing, power. <laughs> power and Mark writing to a Roman audience says, look at the power of Jesus. You think Caesar's got power? You think his legions have power? You think the Senate has power? Look at what Jesus does to demons and this Gadarene demoniac, you know, that's power. Look at Jesus in Mark four, when he speaks to an inanimate object and says, Peace be still and something that doesn't have ears to hear, hears him and hushes. That's power that appeals to the Roman mindset. Uh, so and then Luke, he's not concerned about power. He's writing the Greeks and he's concerned about the poor and compassion. So if you are. Um, if, if you're rich, do not read Luke. <laughs> Don't read Luke. And then John, uh, he's, he's concerned with intellectuals and, 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 and the Hellenist intellectuals. And so you see that those sensibilities in each of their in each of their their uh, in each of their writings. So if that's how Pilate did it and that's how it Pentecost, if that's what Pentecost is all about, each person hearing in their own native tongue. And that's the, the way that the Gospels are written. And if that's how Jesus preached, he talked to farmers about sowing seeds. He talked to fishermen about, I'll make you fishers of men. He talked to a woman at a well using a water metaphor that she could understand that for preaching to be relevant, preaching has to take serious the, 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 the context, the zitzim laban of the audience that you are, you are trying to reach. And I unapologetically do that. That's why I love Jeremiah Wright. I mean, Jeremiah Wright, you know, he took seriously, you know. Now, of course, many will say, okay, that's black stuff. <clears throat> and that's because in our mind, normality is whiteness. And normality is not whiteness, that's idolatry. The beautiful thing about the blood of Jesus Christ is that when you get washed in the blood, it is like Clorox too. It's color safe. <laughs> Your ethnicity does not fade in the washing. So um, my preaching is designed to speak to the needs of black people. Now, <clears throat> what is interesting is that we have whites with 10, whites at 10, and they have to do what blacks do attending white churches because the issues, the analogies, the metaphors, the concerns in the white church reflect the audience and the congregants. So blacks who attend there have to make some adjustments in order to make it relevant to them. Whites who attend 
St. Stephen Church do the same thing. And sometimes they, do, they come because they want the black experience. They want to know uh, the black experience. So uh, I think that's, um, that's how I've attempted to do, to do preaching. So do you do anything with the categories like narrative, expository? Do you do anything with that? Yes, I, 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 um, I love narrative preaching. Um, I love um, the, the ambiguity of creating tension and ambiguity. Um, I love um, a Proctor's thesis, antithesis and synthesis model. Uh, so the whole element of surprise is critically important, I think, in, in preaching. And in, especially being empathetic with the traditional villains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. even if they are bad, what made them that way? Mm -hmm. How can we make Benedict Arnold the hero. Because George Washington says Benedict Arnold is a villain. But King George III <laughs> says Benedict Arnold is a hero. One man's villain is another man's hero. Uh, so um, I, I love uh, of narrative preaching. Um, I, I, th I think it's critically important that preachers be biblically literate. I can't emphasize the importance of reading and studying the Bible, especially through a black lens, but actually reading the text and reading different translations. No preacher should preach a sermon without reading the text in multiple translations and comparing words. And, and it, that helps your preaching. That's the, I think that's the starting point of preaching. Which leads right to my, my next question. Tell us about your sermon preparation process. Well, um, I, I try to do series. So it may be a series on parables, or it may be the Lord's Prayer, a series. Uh, so I, I usually do series preaching, and sometimes it may be based on what I'm studying that may give birth to the sermon, or it may be what the church is grappling with. <clears throat> or it may be what the, the black people are grappling with. So um, that is, that's the start. And then, as I said, in terms of the actual dynamics of it, I just go through and, uh, and I'll take a text and I will read the text in multiple translations. So I'll have pages of comparisons about what how what a word is and how the word may be different. So I'm looking at the text and then critical words that are in the text that I think that I see repeated. Um, I, for example, um, um, like take for example, Second um, Samuel chapter six when it says, and day in six and 13 verse 14 says, and David danced before the Lord in all with all his might. So the, if I'm preaching a sermon like on celebration, I preached recently, we just did, a, I did a series on Black History Month called Meet the Composers. So I did a sermon on, on the comics, laughter. He who sits, Psalm 2, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Mm -hmm. And how God is a God of laughter. And I did a series on the movies, and I did one on uh, Black Panther. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I just did one Sunday on dance and the role that how God has used dance as a as a tool of transformation from everything from the American bandstand and Dick Clark when when Sheriff Jim Clark was fighting against blacks and whites coming together. There was another Clark whom God raised and that was Dick Clark. And um, so in, in the, so I used as, as the sermon for the text, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13, 14, says David danced before the Lord with all his might. So I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna look up those verses. I'm gonna read it from the message. I'm gonna read it from RSV. I'm gonna read it from Moffitt. And I'm gonna write down the differences and how it's, how it's, how it's, it's, it, uh, it's written in different translations. And then I'll take that, if I'm talking about dance, I'm gonna take that one word. And I'm gonna break down that word. I'm gonna go do a, 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 a study on that one word. And it's amazing how much material you can do when you go to your interpreter's dictionary Bible, when you go to Mercer's, the Mercer Dictionary Bible, and you do a, a study just on that one word, a, so much material is going to come that's going to trigger so many ideas just on that one word. Um, and uh, so that's what I do. And then I will begin to do the thesis. Mm -hmm. You know, here's, here's the point. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, here's the antithesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'll just close out by giving examples of examples of examples of why the tension makes sense and how we have to live through the tension. So basically, uh, most of the sermons that I have uh, is going to have a, some tension that has to be resolved because I think that people in the, in, the pew, in the pews, you can keep their attention if you're resolving some tension, especially if it's something that is relevant to, 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 to what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So give me a time when you were, you thought God really used you and give me a time that you preached somewhere inside your church, outside somewhere that it was, you felt just uh, amazingly used by God. And you know, we, we have a lot of humility in preaching, so we tend to, you know. Bill Jones said you shouldn't have it. Right. Bill, Bill Jones right. said you need some, some, some uh, sanctified arrogance. Right, no. see, but we, we, we tend to be better at the times we crashed and burn than the times that we yeah. really, that God really used us. So give yeah. me a time that God really used you and you celebrated and were celebrated. The, the time God used me the most, I mean, I mean, there's, God uses us constantly, but if there's something that sticks out, and let me respond to the question by saying maybe, what were the conditions mm -hmm. in place mm -hmm. that I created for God mm -hmm. to use me the most? Right. When I was angry, mm -hmm. over injustice, when I was mad. Um, and the, the objective of the message was never about making yourself look good, but it's almost like you just said something about my mama. <laughs> you know, that kind of attitude. If you go to the, to the pulpit, you're completely oblivious about how you may look, what you, how you come off, whether you impress the people, it is just, there's a commercial, <laughs> there's a commercial and I forgot what it was, in which a fighter is in the ring and this, um, he's been beat up and he's in the corner and his manager's trying to motivate him. And he said, do you remember when you were younger and somebody stole your french fries? Mm. He said, yeah. That's him. <laughs> and when he remembered that incident, and he said, that's the guy who did it. That, that, he did like this. <clears throat> and even though he'd been beat up, he's going out there. Right. You gotta, when you go to the pulpit with the mind 
This issue is still in black people's french fries. Mm -hmm. That's when I was at my best, and I can tell you when it was. Mm -hmm. The funeral of Muhammad Ali. Mm, tell me about it. I was the first one up. Mm -hmm. It was packed. It was an international audience. I've never spoken to. That was the largest audience probably any preacher has ever preached to, black preacher, in history at one time. And I was angry. And I was angry because they had sanitized Muhammad Ali. They had uh, made him an American mascot. Uh, and the Muhammad Ali of the 60s, mm -hmm. who had been stripped of his title, who said, I'm not going to the war because no Viet Cong called me a nigger. Mm -hmm. uh, the Muhammad Ali, who no one would let train in their gym be, to fight Jerry Quarry when he was allowed to make his comeback, except Morehouse College in Atlanta. That's where he trained. Mm -hmm. That Muhammad Ali had been sanitized and had been used in the service of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So here's, you know, Billy, from Billy Crystal to, Muhammad, to, um, to Bill Clinton, whose draconian legislation put more black men in jail than any president. He did more damage to black people than any president, perhaps in American history. I mean, especially in the 20th century, he damaged black people. And here he is identifying with this firebrand of the 60s, which, they, which meant they, have, they had housebroken him and domesticated Muhammad Ali. And I was determined that when I got up, I was going to return Muhammad Ali back to his blackness. And by the grace of God, that's what I did. I took Muhammad Ali back to blackness, black to the hood, back to the 60s. And I perhaps was the only eulogist that day that did that. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the pulpit with a mission, a noble mission that you are passionate about, and you're driven to do that, God can use you. Now, you still have to do your homework. Mm -hmm. You still got to study. You know, I, I worked on that eulogy for some time. What text? Did you use the text? I did not use a text, but I talked about somebodyness. It's on YouTube, and I talked about. Um, my, I, I, I began this eulogy talking about one of the last interviews of Martin Luther King on the Merv Griffith show. And Merv Griffith asked, and this is late '67. Merv Griffith asked Dr. King. What was the greatest benefit of the civil rights struggle? And Martha King said, it was not the passing of the legislation. He said it was, and I'm paraphrasing him, he said that it was what the struggle did to the psyche of black people that it infused in black people, and this is King's words, a sense of somebodiness, mm -hmm. thesis, mm -hmm. somebodiness. Mm -hmm. That's the thesis of my sermon that day, right. Right. Hegelian, mm -hmm. somebodiness. Antithesis, blacks have lived out nobodiness. So thesis, somebodiness, antithesis, I chronicled how everything in America said to black people, the antithesis of somebodiness, that you are nobody. I quoted the, 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 the Constitution, three-fifths, 
a person for purposes of taxation? Nobody. I'm the first one, no, not Colin Kaepernick, but Kevin Cosby <laughs> was the first one to quote the third verse of the national anthem. I did it at Ali's funeral, I don't, okay? Uh, where it says, no refuge can save the howling or slave from the terror or flight or the doom of the grave. So we know verse one, but verse three celebrates the fact that when the British told enslaved people, if you join the British army, you will experience freedom. But uh, the author, uh, Scott, celebrates in verse three, and everyone should go on line and get all four verses of the national anthem. Look at verse three, where he says, no refuge can save the harling or slave from the terror of flight or the doom of the grave. Who is he talking about? He's talking about black people that we thwarted black liberation. So it's a pro, it's a psalm that is a pro-slavery song. I said that, nobodiness. I talked about Amos and Andy and Tarzan movies. But then, that was the thesis. Thesis, we're somebody. Antithesis, nobody. Synthesis, Muhammad Ali. Before um, uh, uh, James Brown said, I'm black and I'm proud. Muhammad Ali said, I'm black and I'm pretty. <laughs> so, um, that message, uh, and I just went on, and I even I, and unapologetically invoked the name of Jesus. And I mean, Spike Lee's there, on the side is, um, what's the actor, um, Fresh Prince of Blair? Um, Will, Smith. Will Smith is to the side of me. All the, um, all the I mean, it, all these prominent people sitting on the front row, you know, Bill Clinton's, all these, you know, anyone who is anyone has packed out the 20,000 seat Yum Center and you've got national, a national and international live television and international audience. And I'm sitting here because I'm angry because I want them to know, I don't want them co-opting Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali belongs to black people. He benefits all people, but he first and foremost belongs and was born out of the black struggle for somebodyness. And what made us gravitate towards him was not his Islamic faith. It was not that we could care less about his theology. It was that black people were hungering, especially black men, for a sense of somebodyness. With the, which the Christian faith did not give black people because the Christian faith, whiteanity, did not address black needs. Mm -hmm. The nation of Islam did. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X did. Elijah Muhammad did. It addressed black pain, black insecurity that white Christianity had imposed on black people. So I went to, the, to that platform with a passion to get that message across. And I believe God used me quite effectively uh, at, that, at, at that moment. Thank you for that amazing, amazing, amazing. And I'm sure we're gonna, we'll probably, if we can, we'll post up the YouTube video uh, mm -hmm. and we'll talk some more about, that's a powerful, powerful sermon and we wanna make use of it. So we'll talk okay. about that. Now, I want you also, uh, give me an example of a time when you were personally, um, all of us as preachers have moments when it's very difficult for us to preach, either as personal circumstances or church circumstances, we may be preaching, you know, through a storm, as uh, mm -hmm. A. Beecher Hicks says. So give, give the audience a time when 
uh, your most, I would call it under those circumstances, the most difficult time that you had to preach when something uh, was personally either painful or I don't know. Something. Yeah, 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 preaching to the storm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was probably on two occasions. One occasion was um, back in the 90s when I had taken a stand on public education and its negative effect on black kids. And um, many who were in a different camp, I mean, it was, it was a big deal. Many who were of a different philosophy and mindset of me came after me, I mean, they came after me. And because they came after me, they would come back to my congregation, to my congregation. My members had to hear about your pastors, this and your pastor that. And so I had to preach through that because I was going against many of the gatekeepers and um, establishment people. And um, that was challenging. Um, uh, as a second time was when someone had filed a frivolous lawsuit. And I had to preach through that. And that was more of a personal the congregation. It did not affect the congregation. It was a lawsuit against me that was frivolous. And it was dismissed. And then another time was something that affected the congregation, namely the music department, in which uh, I had um, to um, transition the music department in a way that would result in some very prominent personalities within the department no longer being a part of the department. And um, there was a church that had grown within the church. Mm -hmm. And um, there were people who were bitter because um, this, 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 this department, this auxiliary within the church had become the church for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, con the church was an auxiliary of, <laughs> the, of this. So, uh, you know, they came after me. Fortunately, they didn't, at least I don't know, because I, I don't think they did, but uh, they didn't use social media like they do now um, to, to, to attack me. But in any way that you can be attacked, I was attacked. Uh, and it was a time of transition for our congregation. Mm -hmm. And so that was challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, the new challenge that I'm having now is the challenge that while our church is strong, um, many of my members are watching online. Mm -hmm. So the whole online revolution has resulted in people not actually being present like they once were. Now, it's, it's filled. We have six weekend services. Uh, we have three campuses um, in two states, in Indiana, Jeffersonville, which is right across from Louisville, and in the Fort Knox area of Kentucky. So we have three campuses. But the, but the services that are streaming are not as packed. We used to have chairs in the aisles and chairs in front of me, and then we don't have those chairs. There are people that have packed up the pews. So I've had to adjust to not seeing it overflowing with people. And making that adjustment, it's not a crisis or a storm, it's just a matter of making the adjustment and, and assuring the congregation that there's nothing wrong except those people are watching online. Mm -hmm. They're still sending their money online. The offering is not dipped, um, but you don't see that. And, and another crisis is, is the crisis of the millennials, mm -hmm. reaching the millennials. And I'm still trying to work through that. 
Uh, there's no success without successors. And trying to intentionally create an intergenerational church where Jesus, who's 12 years old, is interfacing with the elders in the temple is the model of, ch of the church. We've got to create an intergenerational church. Um, I, as you indicated, I just did a, I did a sermon on dance and uh, we have a youth choir that is amazing. It's over a hundred kids. You can go on YouTube and watch them. It's over a hundred kids in the youth choir. So they were, uh, it, part of the sermon was the whole th purpose of the sermon was to show that, that dance is a good metaphor for a intimate relationship with God. Mm -hmm. That in dancing, you have to be intimate with your partner. And that to dance, you have to um, dance to the same tempo and rhythm. And you have to have a lead and a follower. And in dancing or in relationship with God, you must keep up with the beat and rhythm and temple of God for your life. You must maintain intimacy. You cannot dance with somebody if they're on the wall. They have to be on the floor. And you have to have a lead dancer. Jesus said, follow me. And he's almost, it's like he's saying to Peter, follow me. I'll make you the fishes of men. Follow me. You know, I will be a lead. Let me be, you follow my temple. And so, I talked about different dances, and this was Youth Day, and how different dances God will, um, will, will take you through. Like, um, I, to explain grace, I, I talked about the electric slide, and how, how many times God, because of Christ, has slid us through things that we should have been condemned about. And that should make you electric. I talked about the Cuban cubit shuffle and how God shuffles things so that those who are on the bottom or on the top, you know, marriage magnificat. Um, and I talked about when you're dancing, how you get dipped. And sometimes how God will take you like a Joseph. Joseph was dancing with God and God dipped him. But, he, but anybody who gets dipped, Joseph will tell you. God will bring you back up. And when he brings you up, you're prime minister of all of Egypt. <laughs> you know, but, what, but, what, but the kids were there. So each dance, to illustrate it, I told them, play the music, do the dance. So if we're doing the, the cubits, if I'm saying cubit shuffle, everybody just breaks out. Da, 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 da. If, they're doing the, if I'm talking about slide, they're doing the electric slide, you know? So, you know, Creating a church. Now, interestingly enough, when it was posted online, some of the legalists, mm -hmm. instead of celebrating that you had over 100 kids, 100 kids in a youth choir in church understanding the gospel, using metaphors and analogies, they said, bring the world in the church. You know? And I said, no, we're bringing youth culture into the church. We're bringing people into the church, whatever that means, bring the world into church. I don't understand what that means. But um, so I think that trying to reach the millennials is the great challenge. There's a passage of scripture, uh, a squid story about Hezekiah. After Hezekiah was given 15 additional years, the next chapter after that miracle tells of some Babylonian envoys who visit Hezekiah. And they are there, you know, they've got Hallmark cards and, you know, gift, back, gift baskets congratulating him about over his miraculous healing. And he takes them around and shows them all of his splendor, the temple and all of the gold ornaments that are in the temple. And he leave, they leave. Isaiah comes and says, who were they, Hezekiah? Same Isaiah who just told him, you got 15 more. He said, who were they? He said they were Babylonians. He said, what did you show them? He said, I showed them 
all we have in the temple. He said, you should not have done that. He said, these were not friends. These were enemies who had come uh, to do espionage. He says, and now your sons and your grandsons will be eunuchs because they're coming back. These Babylonians are coming back and they will invade you. And you gave them the blueprint on how to do it. Mm -hmm. And this is what Hezekiah said. He said, this is a good report. Mm -hmm. Now, back up. He just told Hezekiah, these envoys are spies. They're going to use the information you gave them as their attack plan to destroy Jerusalem. They're gonna take your kids and grandkids into captivity. And Hezekiah says, this is a good report. Now, why would you say something so devastating is a good report? Because he then goes on to say, because at least it will not happen in my generation. Mm -hmm. My generation will survive. Mm. Even though the next generation won't. Mm. So he was not a good generational neighbor. Mm. Mm -hmm. We must become generational neighbors. Martin Luther King Jr. was a generational neighbor in the last sermon. He said, I may not get there with you, my generation. Well, watch how ge my generational neighborliness. But we as a people, the next generation, will make it to the promised land. That's what it means to be a generational neighbor. So, so contrast Hezekiah with David. David has in his mind this dream of building God's temple. All the battles have been fought. David ultimately is a worshiper. He's not a warrior, he's a worshiper, but the demands of the day necessitated him fighting the battles of his people and creating a living space, carving out a little space for Israel. But once all the battles have been fought, he looks out and sees the temple of the place of worship is a tent that they've been using since Moses and says, I have a dream of building God a house of worship and brings in Nathan and says, I want to build God a house of worship and I'll pay for it. Now let somebody call me. Let Bill Gates say, I will build a house of worship for you and I'll pay for it. See what I will do. <laughs> and Nathan is happy. But the next day he goes to David and says, you are the king of war. You're not the king of worship. You got blood on your hands. Each generation has its own battles. The man who fought the war is not going to build the house of peace. Churchill fights the war, but as soon as the war is over with, Churchill, who brings England through World War II, is voted out of office after he wins the war because it takes a different skill set than to win the peace. And usually people who can fight the war can't win the peace. <laughs> So God says to David, you fought the wars, but your son Solomon will build the peace. Yeah. You know what David does? He says, I can't build the temple. My name won't be on the cornerstone. The soul Solomon's name will be on the cornerstone. It was my vision. I won't get to see it. But in my generation, I will be a good neighbor to Solomon and I will begin to collect all of the resources and material that is needed to make it easy for Solomon to best what he hooked. Solomon was a bad man, mm -hmm. but Solomon better not smile to smack Solomon. If he ever thinks he got there on his own, it is what the preceding generation What David. David set up Solomon. Hezekiah said why David sets up Solomon for success. Hezekiah sets up the next generation for failure. And the question is, are we going to be more like Hezekiah? Or are we going to be more like David? Mm -hmm. And that is the problem with our conventions. Mm -hmm. we, are, 
we are only concerned about our orthodoxy because it's our orthodoxy. And though millennials are not coming to church, we can, the pastor can say, at least I will get through my tenure to retirement. But what about the next generation? Forget them. And I am convinced that the black struggle is going to take generations. You know, um, it's going to take generations. I'll see some of it in my generation. And in fact, I think we've regressed in my generation. Um, but it's going to take generations of consistency, of continuity. It's going to take Elijah not fighting Elisha, but mentoring. It's going to take Moses not fighting Joshua, but mentoring. It's not going to take Paul not fighting Timothy. It's going to take Benjamin Mays not fighting Martin Luther King, but being generational neighbors. And I think if we're not careful, that the black church can go the way the church of Europe has gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me get this last question to you. Um, you have to preach this morning, so I want to. I want you to talk about the PhD program in African American preaching and how you see it, what it means, just any reflections you have on it. Well, um, I think that it, first of all, has, in my opinion, the greatest um, teacher of preachers in America today. Well, thank you so much, sir. As its chiefdom, and that's you, and I say that. Um, not as uh, mere flattery. I say it because it's true. Um, what you have written, what you've chronicled, um, no one, no one has chronicled in, in the history of black preaching, no one. So, and it's, it's a pioneering effort. It has, this program has no peers. It's unapologetically black. It's rooted in our culture. It's relevant, it's scholarly. Um, and uh, although I have a D-men, and I got my D-men back in 93. United. At United Theological Seminary back in 93. Yes. Um, it is my hope to enroll <laughs> in the PhD program here next year. So if an old, an old player can do it, what about your young players? <laughs> Yeah, so it's, you know what I mean? You know, and, and you know, I, tell, I tell people this all the time. I work out every day. I jog every day. So there's three types of ages, you know, three ages. There's a chronological age. There's a emotional age. There's a biological age. I'm chronologically, I'll be chronologically, I'm chronologically 59. I'll be 60 this year. That's my chronological age. My biological age, according to my physician, because I jog every day. I never have been jogging for 35 years and still play basketball. So I have a different biological age. I do five miles every day, even on Sundays after preaching. So I keep my weight down, I watch what I eat. So according to all my blood pressure and cholesterol count, it's really good. I mean, really good. And that's because I take care of myself. I've never had a drink in my life. I've never tasted a drop of liquor. I've never had a cigarette. I've never had a joint. I've never smoked weed. I've never done any of that. Okay, I've been with one woman. I've got a wife. Okay, so I'm, my biological. So if you take care of yourself, but then you have an emotional age, which is the most important age. And you really only get old when you allow your emotions to get old. Mm -hmm. 
that's the starting point of age. Um, when you stop learning or stop aspiring to learn, um, and um, I think that's when you get old, or when you think there's something new, there's something you cannot learn. So um, I, I'm, I want to get into the PhD program here, and, and uh, it's because of you, it's because of what this program is, is offering the black pulpit and the black church, which has never been offered before. I mean, I think that there was an attempt to do it at, at United, but not on the level. So this, to me, United was a great program with Dr. Proctor. This is United on steroids. So um, I think it's an outstanding program. And I think that the students that matriculate through this program will help to shape the future for the black church and to make it relevant uh, to the millennials. I wanna thank you for your time, for your insight, for your wisdom. Um, this has been a tremendous discussion. I know that it's going to bless and touch many people. And so I just want to appreciate you um, for the totality, the thought, the scholarship, the depth of heart, the love, the creativity that you bring um, both to St. Stephen and also to Simmons. Thank and you, um, we look forward to making linkages between this program Correct. and Simmons. Absolutely. Because we believe in what you're doing right. and we support what you're doing. And we want to be a part of what you're doing. You talk about being a part of what we're doing. We right. want to be a part of what you're doing. Yeah. It's a vital ministry, and it's a model that needs to be replicated across. And I think this model will reach the millennial generation because this generation seems to be about what are you doing? Right. Not what are you talking? Right. And you show sure enough doing that. If you just keep doing it, millennials are going to fly. You're doing it. So I, I just. Well, brother, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. Thanks. Okay, brother. Okay. okay. okay.